a new language as, as a whole. So, talking about our objectives today, bring a new perspective or a shift in paradigm, as I mentioned before, on the use of L1 in the classroom and having students in mind in, in the first place. Uh, and after that, try to reflect a little bit upon, reevaluate, and possibly change our practices in the classroom or in virtual classrooms in this moment, let's say, uh, while planning and delivering such lessons. Our agenda, we're basically going to talk about the past, why we have not discussed this topic in such a, a long time and why we do not or we say we do not use a one in the classroom. We're going to talk a little bit about the present and why this is the perfect timing for paradigm shift. Uh, after that, I want to talk to you a little bit about students' perspective about this topic. After all, they are what matters here. And then we'll close up with a, a little overview about the future. So first part of the past, I think it's important for us to understand a little bit of the historical background of the teaching methods that uh, have brought us uh, to the point in which we are today. So the quote here is that we should investigate and we should reflect upon why we do things the way we do today and why L1 has been banned from English classrooms around the world. So um, there's this belief that English is best taught without the interference or the mediation of L1. And this can be traced back to the beginning of the 20th century. And uh, this happened for basically two reasons. The first reason was that uh, there were a lot of private language schools coming to business and their main focus were for adults. And these adults, they wanted to learn English for very practical reasons and not uh, academic ones as uh, children or people in the academic area as a whole. The second and maybe more most, most important uh, aspect of this, of this tracing back is that uh, many of these schools focused on, uh, as a marketing strategy, they focused on trying to differentiate themselves from regular schools in which children and teenagers learned English as a second language. Uh, and then they tried to, to use this as a marketing strategy, as I mentioned. So we are different because we don't use translation. We are different because we, uh, we only speak English in the classroom. So this is actually a business oriented, uh, in the beginning, of course, this was a, bit, a very much business oriented um, uh, um, path let's say. Uh, this is a very quick timeline of the teaching methods. So as you can see in the beginning of the 20th century, there was the, the grammar translation was very, uh, very prominent. And then from the 70s on, we started reassessing the ways in which a second language uh, was taught. And many of these ways uh, were the ones uh, that brought us to, to, to ban L1 in the classroom. So if you think of the communicative language teaching approach or um, the, the, the community language learning, the, these, these new methods from the 70s on, they primarily focused on experience and one way, again, to differentiate themselves from the grammar translation met method was to uh, market themselves as English only speaking environments. So just a little bit of comparisons, as, as I mentioned, up to the 70s, the idea of this grammar translation method was to focus basically on reading and writing. Uh, speaking was very much overlooked, um, uh, specifically for academic reasons, and then translation was very much involved. Whereas from the 50s or 70s onwards, we had more of a behavioristic approach to language learning and very much focused on the four competences uh, and a more holistic approach. And this is where 
um, L1 kind of lost its its position, let's say. However, um, I'd like to ask you these questions. Have our choices been made consciously or not in the best interest of our learners? So I told you about the marketing strategies, the, the importance of differentiating a, a, a line of work, but have we ever stopped and thought for the moment about our learners experience and if that banning of L1 has brought to them positive or negative results. So this is something for us to think about. Second part, analyzing the past. It's very important that we look back in time and analyze our personal journey as a teacher. So the role of, of the academic life and our professional development and our professional practices as, uh, as, as one of the reasons why we have the beliefs we do or we are wearing the glasses we're wearing at the moment. So uh, according to some studies in the area, and I'm gonna show you the references in a while, our attitudes uh, towards the use of English uh, the, the, the idea of English only classrooms, they reflect, they are reflected a lot in our, in our views. So these are composed of our own experience as a language learner. So if our contact with L1 during the process of learning English, if that was positive or not for us, if that has brought us to, to our own practice of English teaching in a positive way, Pre-service and in-service training are fundamental because sometimes as a person, I have my belief, but working for an institution, I, am, uh, I, I need to sort of mold myself to the way that the institutions uh, views L1. So talking about institution, institutional policies uh, in which we are all working, and of course, our overall experience as teachers in the classrooms daily and the feedback and the response we get from our students. So Hall and Cook are two of the experts in the area of, um, of the use of L1 in different in, in uh, foreign classrooms, foreign English classrooms. And they have this very interesting quote that I wanted to, to talk to you about. Taking a global figure of English language teachers working in a wide variety of contexts, the majority of us believe that L1 should be excluded or limited in English lessons. However, and then uh, when they started investigating this a little bit uh, uh, in, a, in a deeper way, they found that a lot of us actually do use L1 in our classrooms, although we are not willing to admit and uh, maybe our attitude towards is different but when it comes to closing the door and being there with my students and thinking about what is best for them i i do make use of l1 somehow it's sort of a, of a paradox right so uh, while Hall and Cook were uh, investigating this issue, uh, they talked to a lot of teachers and a lot of them actually used the, the word resort to L1 or in our case, resort to Portuguese instead of using L1. So a lot of teachers wouldn't say, I use L1 with my students. They would say, I resort to L1 which is a very interesting lexical choice because uh, there's this impression that if I say that I am using L1, uh, it comes with a feeling of guilt. It comes with a feeling that what I'm doing is wrong according to our institutional beliefs or my own beliefs uh, towards English teaching. But uh, a sense of guilt is unlikely to be helpful when teachers are trying to strive and are trying to understand and reflect upon issues to develop professionally. So if we are feeling guilty because we make use of L1 in the classroom, that sort of paralyzes us. That means that uh, we are 
doing something that we believe it's wrong and then we don't reflect upon it we don't have conversations about it and this is not a good way for us to develop professionally so just a bit of a conclusion towards the past and why we do things the way we do as i mentioned we do need to consider the origin of this idea of l1 uh, ban which was uh, which came from the evolution of the teaching methods and our our views on on the use of l1 uh, we do need to take into consideration that in the first place uh, this was sort of, we, we can say that this was sort of a marketing choice in a way uh, to help those schools who were um, who were coming to business to differentiate themselves from other uh, institutions and products in the market. We need to consider our own personal journey with the language as learners, as teachers, and within the institution we work for. And in spite of all of that, we do tend to use more N1 than we, than we are willing to share. And uh, it's important to understand why, why we're doing so. So let's talk a little bit about today. What is our current use of L1 in the classroom? Let's have a little bit of a, a, an insight in why and when we are willing to do so, even though we may feel guilty about it. So why are we doing it when we are doing it? These are the contexts in which most teachers uh, admitted, let's say, that they use L1 in the classroom. So especially with classes of students at lower levels, because using L1 may aid motivation, alleviate frustration. And then when we are talking about the effective filter, this is quite important. A lot of teachers mentioned that they make use of L1 with larger classes due to discipline issues, so classroom management. Um, the length of a lesson, because for a beginner level student, for example, uh, over one hour of just practicing and exercising my brain, to, my brain to speak in English can be a very tiring uh, task. And of course, our pre, uh, we need to consider previous learning experience from students. So uh, their social background and so on and so forth. So why do we use L1? So one more time, that study from Hall and Cook that I mentioned uh, a while ago. We use it for mainly two reasons, for core functions and social functions. And I think it's important for us to sort of make this division and understand why we're doing it. Because as long as it's justifiable, there is no need for the sense of guilt that I, that I mentioned earlier. So the core reasons are the ones related to teaching itself, the teaching of the language. So when we are explaining grammar or vocabulary, we may, we may use direct translation. When we are checking understanding with students, so we give instructions and then uh, to check the, and to ensure they're going to do what they're required to do, we, use, we make use of Portuguese or L1, we make use of L1 to, to, to make sure of that. But we also use our one with social functions, uh, mostly related to um, classroom management, which are managing personal relationships. So a lot of focus on report, on dealing with the effective filter, as I mentioned, while giving instructions or, of course, dealing with admin uh, tasks. Why else? Discipline is always a big issue when, whenever there's a study about the use of L1 in the classroom. And there's this very interesting aspect about uh, trying not to use English uh, when you're sort of telling students off because uh, they may make a negative association. Remember that most of our memorization comes from emotions. And if we have this negative association with English that might create a barrier that we are not even aware of or um, capable of processing. Uh, so expressions of sympathy as well. So we may use a one to say something nice to a student that day, even maybe before the lesson starts, like, oh, como seu cabelo tá bonito hoje, something like that to, let's say, to lift the spirit. 
we do make use of L1 to speed things up uh, sometimes, right? So uh, if I need to draw something that is very abstract on the board to, uh, to explain a very abstract concept, sometimes if I make use of the direct translation, I'm speeding things up and uh, that has uh, its own benefits. And of course, with young learners, students, I, I saw that someone mentioned here in the chat that they use a more L1 with children. So this is one of the reasons why. What about, uh, we talked about institutions, but what about international uh, associations of, of English language, such as the Common European Framework? I don't know if you have had the opportunity of seeing the new document uh, of the Common European Framework, but uh, L1 use permeates a few of the important changes in the new updated version of uh, the CEFR, and I'm going to talk about them right now. So this is what the new document looks like. I, I think it's, it's from last year, no, 2018, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, this is the QR code for, for you to download the new version of the CEFR. Of course, if you don't have time to do it now, you just all you have to do is Google for uh, CEFR updated version. So what does it say? What, what do these new changes bring? Uh, they say that a bilingual approach is likely to be uh, more appropriate and more fruitful than uh, the, this strict policy of English only we have been using for many years. So these new uh, can-do statements in the, in the Common European Framework includes mediation and translation as key components in their new, in, in their new framework. So what is, what is mediation? Uh, it's when a student acts as a social agent, and here I'd like to stress the, the, the word social, because after all, we're all teaching English as a, uh, as a means for our students to navigate the world socially. This is what we're trying to provide for them. So the student is a social agent that creates bridges and helps to construct or to convey meaning uh, sometimes within the same language and often across languages. So this is what they say mediation is. And it is a very, very important skill to possess, especially if you live in a bilingual um, context. Um, <clears throat> sorry. So as I mentioned, the can-do can statements include mediation and also translating or even explaining things from one language to another uh, in, its, in its new document. So let's talk about um, those glasses I mentioned at the beginning. Let's try to deconstruct some of our beliefs. And to do that, we need to see some of the arguments that have been, uh, have been mentioned during these years uh, in favor of a, a, an English-only policy uh, environment. So reflecting upon that uh, may not be easy, may not be comfortable, but it may be necessary. And especially if we're taking into consideration uh, virtual lessons, online lessons, lessons in which we do not, uh, we cannot use our whole body as an instrument to convey meaning. For example, we just can use facial expressions, we can try to draw something on the screen, but we know how hard it is to deal with so many things happening at the same time on the screen. So let's have a look into that. These are the arguments, but we are actually going one by one now. So the first argument in favor of banning L1 in the classroom is learners need to learn how to think in English. And if they are thinking in L1, this may discourage uh, learners to do so. So this uh, premise, let's say, comes from the idea that languages are sort of compared compartmentalized in the brain, like there's this section for Portuguese and there's this section for English. However, it is known that the brain can, can and uh, has the ability 
to process two languages at a time. So it's an, it's one thing to be to be taken into consideration. One of the hardest truths we need to 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 analyze is that most of our learners do not wish or do not need to reach a level of English in which they are required to think in English. Instead, most people, and in, in, again, considering our reality here in Brazil, most people need some sort, some level of fluency in terms of processing English mentally without having to translate, to translate it. So one thing is to think in English like, like we teachers need to do. And another thing is maybe receiving an information in Portuguese and translating it into English for the conference call and etc. So um, it's it's I think it's one of the truths that we need to 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 have a closer look at. Uh, the exclusion of L1 does not accelerate the development of fluency. Of course, guys, uh, I can see some of your interactions here in the chat, and I just I would just like to make it clear that. This is not a formula, as we discussed in the beginning. Uh, it's it's not a recipe. It might not work for all sorts of uh, contexts. This is the I consider this talk as a beginning of a conversation. What we cannot do is stop talking about it and and stop reflecting about it, right? So, uh, for example, the exclusion of L1 does not accelerate the development of fluency. Of course, that's debatable. Of course, we can look into different studies and we can, as teachers can talk to each other and check if this is true for higher levels, but not for lower levels, but not for kids, for example. But uh, I think that uh, the idea now is to provoke with these with this kind of thoughts. The second uh, aspect here is that so this is one of the arguments for banning L1 in the classroom. Uh, the use of L1 will exacerbate the problems of first language interference. This is one of the most uh, important reasons why we, we avoid the use of L1. However, I think it's important to understand that we may tend to notice when L1 interferes in a negative way or when it leads to errors instead of when uh, it leads to accurate language use. So a very good example of that is uh, they use the uh, when we are teaching the third conditional, for example, there are so many verbs involved. It's such a long structure and they need to remember the past participle, so on, so forth. So sometimes if we just go like have um, been doing and you go word by word, and I've done that. Que joga primeira pedra, quem nunca? I've done that. Uh, you see students' eyes sort of bright and you go, ah, okay, now I get it. So what I'm trying to say is that sometimes we tend to look into Portuguese or L1 interference as something negative, and we tend to overlook the situations in which this comparison can be helpful. Uh, considering false friends, this is a very polemic one. Uh, some st studies say that it's hard to think of a more efficient way of dealing with emergent with uh, false friends or false uh, false friends than comparing them in the two languages. So uh, the classic example of actually. A lot of students say it's atualmente, but it's not. So the, the whole idea is that maybe the best way to clarify meaning is just to say, look, this is not what it is in Portuguese yet. It's na verdade and not atualmente. So comparing and contrasting false friends, uh, especially for lower levels, especially for kids, for example, this may be a, a good way out or a quick way out. Then uh, another quote from one of these studies. Um, more generally, a word for word translation task may be one of the most effective ways of encouraging learners to notice the differences between English and L1. So here we're talking about not only learning English 
as a sort of mechanic process, but something that I sit and I reflect upon and I compare with my language and I analyze the differences and then I become aware of the language in a more holistic uh, sense. Another argument in favor of L1 ban in the classrooms. Uh, the time that we spend using L1 is time not spent using English. So it deprives learners a valuable learning opportunity. Of course, that uh, we want students to use uh, as many English as possible in the classroom. Uh, but that does not necessarily mean that all exchanges should be done in English. And if you think of a lower level students, for example, the simple tasks such as comparing answers or, uh, I don't know, having a very quick chat to your classmate about what happened during the day. If we ask students to do that in English all the time, as we've seen before, that is very tiring and it brings frustration and uh, remember negative feelings is what we are trying to avoid when we're talking about learning we want them to have a good experience considering lower levels again and young learners allowing them to switch between l1 and l2 may help develop se the sense of self-motivation and uh, training for strategies so the learning to learn moments how am i going to explain a student of how to listen for a gist and how to listen for detailed information. Uh, I cannot do that with a basic one student in English. It's very, uh, it's very demanding for them. So using L1 for moments of developing strategies is using L1, of course, we're not taking this time to use L2, but it is in favor of learning L2 and learning English in a broader sense. L1 used by teachers as an economic tool may make more time available for students to speak English. So as I mentioned, sometimes when you go for the easy trans for the quick translation instead of trying to draw something on the board that is going to take three or four minutes and students guessing, if you just go like, yeah, this is it, that uh, allows more time and more space for students to make use of English. So it kind of compensates. For long, we have considered that translation is not a valuable skill to possess. And uh, if, if we look into translation as in a broader way, such as uh, the use of mediation, the use of uh, uh, the, the ability of being able to convey meaning from one language to another, the valuable the value is undeniable. And uh, whether we like it or not, translation is part of our students' reality and our students' practice, especially if they uh, live abroad. It has very rich and rich educational potential potential for learning for diagnosing their own level of English and as a testing tool. And as we've seen, uh, even the core common European framework is considering is considering now translation as a valuable asset. So in conclusion about the present, uh, we do make use of L1 in our classroom whether we are conscious of it or not, uh, mainly for uh, classroom management issues and for establishing good relationships, good report. As I mentioned, the new Common European Framework started to slowly change the, the perspective over the necessity and the benefits of L1 use in, uh, in uh, English environments. And uh, this can be the perfect timing for us to de deconstruct a few, of, a few of our professional beliefs. Reflecting upon that is the beginning of a conversation. As I said, when we, are, when we were starting to have a look at these arguments and counter, counter arguments, I think that talking about it, opening 
the space to talk about it without shame and without guilt is a starting point. It's not going to finish here. It's just a starting point. So ultimately, students may be the ones to provide us with valuable insights on this topic. So some surveys have been actually carried out with students as well. And uh, a lot of students replied that the use of L1 in their classes show uh, uh, the, the majority of them actually approve some use of L1. Uh, of course, that across levels that might change. But maybe uh, listening to your own students can be a, a good resource because, as I said, with different levels, it, it works differently. With different social backgrounds, it works differently, and so on and so forth. So maybe a questionnaire can be a good starting point to discussing that with your different group profiles. And then from this questionnaire, you can uh, think of a class policy uh, in which uh, establishing the, the, the situations in which L1 is allowed and the other situations in which it's not. Uh, talking to this about uh, talking about this with students may lead uh, to to a great reflection and to greater awareness of themselves as learners. So most of them have never actually stopped to think, why do I need the translation for that word? Or do I really need the translation of that word? So what I did as a more hands-on approach, I interviewed a third graders last year in one of the partner schools that I work with. And the very first time that I asked, do you think I should use uh, Portuguese in, in, in our lessons? They said, yes, yes, yes. Oh, and why is that? And then they said, and I'm going to say it in Portuguese. Ah, porque se você não falar o significado da palavra em português, a gente não vai entender. And then I asked, but wait, what about if I, if I say apple and I show you the picture of an apple? Do you really need me to say maçã for your confirmation? And then I could really see the question marks rising from their foreheads like, oh yeah, I've never thought about that. So maybe having this conversation can, be, can bring to an opposite result, can bring to students uh, not wanting a lot of Portuguese in the classroom, but the other way around, oh, now I realize that I don't need that confirmation in Portuguese. So talking about it is the, the silver lining here. This is an example of a questionnaire that you can bring to your students. So do you prefer your teacher to use your own language when? So I list for them the situations because if it's an, a very open question, it doesn't bring the awareness that I was talking about. So. Do you want your, in, your teacher to use English when giving instructions, when correcting your errors, when uh, you're just chatting and not talking about what you're studying? And um, do you prefer your teacher to allow you to use your own language and then listing the situations as well? And then they go for the frequency. Of course, it's not going to be a consensus because each individual has its own experience with language learning. But as I said, uh, talking about it and maybe raising this awareness might bring you to a, a more um, cohesive group in terms of awareness, especially considering lower level adults, for example, because they always think they need the translation for something. And sometimes that is true. Sometimes they might need it, but sometimes it may not be true. We may resort to pictures, to facial expressions as I was saying. This is uh, another polemic quote from Philipson. Uh, I just forgot the name of the book now, but it's something about colonialism. And it says, when the mother tongue is banned from the classroom, the teaching leads to the alienation of our learners. It deprives them of their cultural identity and it leads to acculturation rather than increased intercultural communicative competence. 
So I think it's important to even look back into history and uh, understand why we are all learning English and uh, think of the colonies, for example. So if I am depriving my student of expressing its own cultural identity in the classroom, what are the consequences of that? A lot has been said about pronunciation lately, for example. A lot of lower level students come to us and they say, ah, mas a minha pronúncia, porque eu falo heavy, porque eu falo doggy. And uh, the idea of global English is more and more present, especially in terms of pronunciation. So it's not a problem if you sound Brazilian when you're speaking English, as long as it does not interfere in communication. This is something that I always tell my students. I had a student, I saw that there were many people here from Bahia. I had a student from Bahia last year, and she had this very, very cute Baiano accent while speaking English. And she was so embarrassed about it. So we had this honest conversation and I said, this is your identity. You don't have to lose it while speaking English. Of course, that if people cannot understand you, there are always things you can do to improve, but do not be ashamed of it. And it's part of you, not only as a learner, but as a person, as a, a human being. So what about the future? And uh, I don't have the answers for that. As I mentioned, uh, this is just the beginning of a conversation, or maybe this is just the beginning of putting this topic into the, into the talk, the international talks, or the, the, the talks you have in the staff room with your colleagues at your institutions. There is no recipe, there is no formula. Uh, I just think it's important for us to to think of our learners in the first place and to try to deconstruct some of these beliefs. Uh, of course, as I mentioned before, it's not gonna be a consensus, but it is something that we, we need to start thinking about and we need to start bringing to the table maybe a bit more often. And in this COVID-19 times, how about stopped and reflecting the impact of L1 use in the online environment. Maybe this is something we can all look into and uh, why not a topic for further studies from, from your part and with your, with your participation. So these are the references. A lot of the studies that I used to, to um, to guide this talk are here. I'd like to just uh, uh, emphasize this study from Howe and Cook from 2013. It's a, a very, uh, a very important study in the area. Uh, and uh, I think that's it, guys. So we may open for a few questions now. You can type your questions in the chat. I'm just going to mute my mic here while we I, I'll, I'll have a look here in the in the chat. Uh, I would just like to mention that while I was talking, I was trying to have a look at the comment section at the chat box at the same time, and I saw very long uh, and very long uh, comments. I just could not uh, uh, read them all at the same time, but I promise I'll, I'll have a look. And of course, uh, as I said, it's an open conversation and you can uh, always reach out uh, to me. You can have a look at these studies uh, talk to your peers about it, but if you do have any any specific questions about these studies, I'm more than happy to uh, 
to talk to you about. And this is why I'm going to show you my email address now. It's deborah.bonifacio at myclass.com.br. And uh, yeah, we, we can talk more about it if you want to. I can see that some people are asking about uh, a certificate for the session. I think then we would have to talk to people from Giselle about it. I don't have the answer for that. I'm sorry. I saw someone here talking about students expressing their preferences for using for the teacher to use L1 while explaining grammar and then that you insert some moments of Spanish. I mean, if it's, as, as I said, as long as it's justifiable and as long we are not doing it just because the students believe it's best for them, but we first make them aware of why it's important for them and why it may not be important for them anymore, I think there's no problem at all. Isn't the use of L1 a, more, a manifestation of, uh, I lost the question, let me see, of the teacher's lack of training? It, uh, it could be, it could be. I, I don't think there is a an, uh, an universal answer for that. Uh, I think that in the beginning, we're all more insecure, especially if we are talking all about our own uh, English competency, our own level of English. So uh, one thing that can actually help with that, with a uh, teacher's confidence into using uh, more English in, the, in, their, in their classrooms is actually exposing yourself to higher levels. I usually say that the best way to learn a language is to teach it because once you teach it, you need to know everything about it to be exposed to all sorts of questions students are going to bring so exposing yourself to higher level uh, higher, higher level groups can help with that and attending to trainings uh, so sometimes we think that trainings need to be within this, this institution but webinars like these for example these initi initiatives from Dizal can be a, go a, a very good source of um, self self training let's say or self-awareness. Do you think the assessments in the international proficiency tests are considering the inclusion of bilingualism included in CFR? Uh, from a personal perspective, I don't think so, uh, especially because we know uh, the process involved in the development of these tests is so complex because it's it's uh, worldwide right it has to be distributed and applied worldwide and considering cambridge standards they do take a while to change a few of these perspectives uh, but i saw the changes in the cefr in a very positive way and actually as a, a very positive surprise have language schools been changing this idea in accepting L1 in the classroom? This is a tough question. Um, I actually don't know. Uh, what, what I can say uh, from Cultura Inglesa, which is the institution that I work for, some adaptations have already started. So for lower levels, for example, now, uh, when we are talking about the, the communicative objective of a lesson, there is the Brazilian flag button and you can actually click on it and the communica communicative objective is done in Portuguese for basic one, basic two students. So it's such a small step, but I think it's very meaningful. And maybe our job is to, again, start having these conversations with them. Juan Carlos from Colombia. Thank you. Thank you for being here. So everyone, let me just go down in the chat box a little bit. Well, um, any more questions, guys? Thank you. Thank you all for the very kind words. 
uh, I hope that this has been uh, useful to you somehow. And then again, uh, reach out through my email if you want to, to discuss more. Okay. So I guess now we're uh, handing in to Giselle. I don't know if they want to say something or if we're just ending our, our transmission here. Let me check on them.